right, good morning, familia. Can you do me a favor and stand for the reading of God's Word? We're going to be reading for, from Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verses 10 to 14. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to uh, 14. If you are here with me, could you please say, I'm here. I'm here. I, ha- I had to do that, man, because the fact that you're here today with this crazy weather is a miracle in itself. All right. The Word of God goes like this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. So when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. This is the word of the Lord. I pray, Lord, that you speak to us this morning. I pray, Lord, that you use your word in such a way, Lord, that we we are convinced not only of the presence of this uh, of the presence of evil in this world, but that we are convinced that we are not just victims, that you have given us what is necessary in Jesus to fight against the devil and what he does. Please make it clear to us this morning. Holy Spirit, speak to us, illuminate our minds, give us gifts, uh, the gift of repentance. And allow us to believe. In the name of Jesus we pray and we all say, you may be seated. So for the beginning of 2020, uh, as a church, we wanted to start the year by reflecting and learning from Scripture what it means to be a Christian living in a fallen world in which evil is always present. For the beginning of this uh, new year, we wanted to reflect and learn from Scripture what it means to be a believer in what C.S. Lewis would call an enemy-occupied land. And the reason why we wanted to do that is because um, the reality is that evil is real, the devil is real, and he affects uh, everything we are, everything we do. He affects us as individuals. He affects Uh, Our our relationships, he affects the way we view God, he affects the way we work, he affects everything in life. And that's why we call this series Spiritual War. Now, this section of the scripture is known as spiritual warfare. The reason why we chose the word war is because it best describes what we go through as believers, if you are a believer, uh, when we live in this world and the devil is present. What is beautiful about the text we just read, though, is that not only explains the reality of an evil world, if you will, but it also shows us what we have in Jesus, what we will call the weapons that equip us to be able to confront the reality of this world. And that is known as the armor of God, traditionally. Today we're going to be looking at the first two weapons God provides or God gives us to be able to fight this war. And these are the belt of truth, the belt of truth, and the breastplate of righteousness. And with these two principles here, with these two weapons, if you will, here, we learn two things. One is that we have a foundation of truth, and two, that we have a practical doctrine. One, that this is one is a foundation of truth, and the other one is a practical doctrine. So I'm going to start with the first one. Let's go with the foundation of truth. Um, let me give you a little bit of a summary here, especially... For those of you that were not here at the beginning of this series, first uh, Sunday of the year. Um, so so uh, le- allow me to explain a little bit what verses 10 to or through 13 talk about. Because that's what Rob preached about at the beginning of the year. In those verses, we find the description of a spiritual war. And Paul, the writer of this letter, 
says and makes it clear and assumes that the devil is real and that he's active. And we can see that in verse 11 when he says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil and his schemes. Now, in verse uh, number 12, verse 12, Paul describes in even more detail the devil's activity. And he uses words such as rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world, and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, Rob already explained many of these things, so I'm not going to explain it again. If you want to listen to the sermon, please go to our website. But this is my summary of what Paul is saying in verse 12. That the devil is real, that he's active, and that he works in people, through people, and outside of people. That the devil is real, and he's active, and he uses people, he uses systems, he uses social structures, he uses ideas to make your life miserable and to ruin this creation. That is the simple explanation of that. And then Paul argues that no one can escape that reality. That we're all going to face the devil. That we're all going to be engaged in a spiritual war. And he makes it extremely clear in verse 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes. Notice that it doesn't say if the day of evil comes, but when the day of evil comes. The devil is real, he's active, he works in people, through people, and outside of people, and no one escapes that that reality. Happy New Year. (laughs) That's just what it is. That's all the description from verses 10 to 13. So the question, of course, is what do we do then? And then Paul here gives us two things in the same verses. He says that we have two responsibilities, if you will. One, we have to put the full armor of God. And the second one, we got to learn how to stand. That's all part of the summary. He puts it here in verse 11. He says, put put the full armor of God. And he repeats it again in verse 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. What is amazing about this, though, is that he uses this word, that it seems uh, like a paradox. Like it seems like if he's contradicting what he says right here, he says, stand your ground. Stand. Isn't that interesting? He's not calling us to uh, exercise exorcism. He's not calling us to rebuke the devil. He's not calling us to cast out demons in the name of Jesus. Listen, there's nothing wrong with Some of those things. And I think that the Bible talks about some of those things. But what Paul calls us to do here is to stand firm. Because when we stand firm, we are being active, we are being offensive, and we are being defensive, even though it seems like we're not doing anything. Stand firm. Now, what is interesting about the word stand is that it means this, to hold on to something. It's not like, no, it's hold on to something, cling to something. That in the midst of everything we go through and the problems we have and what the devil does in our lives, in us, through us, and through other people, we hold on to this crazy conviction That regardless of what happens, we stand firm. So when I was writing this, this, for some reason, uh, this uh, image came to mind. Um, I'm sure that you've seen a palm tree in the middle of a storm. I I love that image. Because um, picture you being the palm tree. And picture being uh, evil in this world and the devil in this world being the, the storm. Now, listen, listen up, people. God never promises that you're not going to struggle. Actually, the Bible tells you time and time again that we will go through the storm. Just like a palm tree goes through the storm. 
There is no way around it. It doesn't matter how much money you have, where you live, how protected you are, how big your walls are. It doesn't matter. You struggle. Just like the palm tree goes through the storm. And if you see that picture, and if you've ever seen that picture, it's crazy to see how the palm moves back and forth. Back and forth. But he never goes away. Because he's grounded in something. He's holding on to something. The foundation is strong. So, of course, the question has to be, what's our foundation? What is it that we're holding on to in the middle of the storm? What is the thing we must do, the thing we have to stand strong? And Paul says then that the first thing we have is the belt of truth. Stand firm in the belt of truth. And here he starts describing the armor of God. You know what's super interesting, though? That the belt is not part of the armor. I mean, it plays a function. It protects the private parts of the soldier. But it technically is not part of the armor. I would say, and the way some scholars would, would describe this, is the, the belt was the thing that came before everything else, and the belt is what held everything together. In other words, if there is no belt, there is nothing else. If the foundation is not the belt, the belt of truth, there's nothing else. So once again, writing this, I remember when I was in high school, which that was uh, a bunch of years ago. The, in high school is when this, the, the style of these low, baggy, saggy pants became popular. That was when I was in high school. For those of you that thought that was a modern thing, no, it wasn't a modern thing. It was, you know, 10 years ago, right? Uh, <laughs> and I remember, please keep your opinions. Uh, but, and I remember that uh, the first week I saw that, but my first reaction was to say, man, that's ridiculous. Right, you see all these kids walking, it's like you know, something went wrong, right? It's, it, that was the first week. But the second week, I started doing the same thing. You know, peer pressure, all that stuff. But I learned really quick that in order for you to do that, you don't have to wear a belt. But I also learned that that was extremely uncomfortable <laughs> and extremely impractical. You know why? Because if there's one thing that I could not do was run. <laughs> you cannot run. You cannot run. You, 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 you just can't. It's either fashion or your life. I was living in the city, people. In the ugly side of the city, because the city is nice in some parts. But it's, it's, it, was either my, it was either my fashion or, or my life. And I think that that's what Paul has in mind when he's talking about this. He's saying the most foundational thing, the things that hold everything together, the thing that keeps you grounded must be the truth of God, must be the word of God. Now, this is the crazy thing, that when scholars are studying this passage, uh, there's this division. Some scholars would say, well, what Paul means by the truth here has to be a scripture. And I would say, amen. Other scholars would say that what Paul is talking about here is not just a scripture, but a scripture, the truth, applied to us. And I would say, amen. The reason why I say yes to both of those is because of John Stott. He argued that you don't have to make that distinction. That when you claim to believe in the word of God, it's because that is the word of God, but that the Word of God always has implications, and we always ought to um, uh, implement it in every area of our lives. So let me give you a description, simple description of what the belt of truth means. Is the belt of truth is objective truth, Scripture, used subjectively. It is to believe that the Word of God is the Word of God, objective truth, but that that Word of God are 
the, its main function is to affect the way we live. And what Paul is arguing here is that the only way that you can fight against the devil and the only way you can fight against evil in this world is when you truly believe and trust in the most foundation th foundational thing, which is the word of God. And what Paul argues here, that is not just about us reading and learning the word of God. It's about learning to let the word of God read us and affect us. That is not just about knowing and confessing that this is the word of God, but that, that it is about us trusting in its sufficiency and its power. That this is not just a book, but that it's sufficient and that it's powerful. Listen to the words of Rosaria Butterfield, of this writer and Bible teacher, an amazing lady. She says this. The internal mission of the Bible is to transform the nature of humanity. If God is the creator of all things, and if the Bible has his seal of truth and power, then the Bible has the right to question my life and culture and not the other way around. In other words, we submit to the scripture, not the scripture submits to us. Listen to R.C. Sproul, a great theologian and pastor that passed away last year. I think that the greatest weakness in the church today is that almost no one believes that God invests his power in the Bible. You heard that? God invests his power in the Bible. Everyone is looking for power in a program, in a technique, in anything and everything except where God has placed it, his word. The most foundational thing. The most foundational thing. There is a reason why we are called a Bible church. There is a reason why we believe in life groups. Because that's where we learn the Bible and apply the Bible. That is the reason why we believe in small groups, some sort of community. So we learn the Bible, apply the Bible, learn the Bible, memorize the Bible, breathe the Bible. You know, there's something that I find amazing in, in, in Paul's writings here because when he talks about the devil, he doesn't use words that we find all throughout the scripture. So, for example, he doesn't call the devil the accuser, which is one of the names in the Bible, the adversary, the enemy, the evil one, the murderer, the prince of the power of the air. He doesn't call him Satan. He doesn't call him the tempter. He calls him the devil. You know what the devil means? Liar. The devil, the word level means deceiver. That's why he's also called the father of lies. Now let me ask you something. If you don't know what the truth is, how do you know what a lie is? If you don't know what the word says, how do you know when the devil is doing something with you? Interesting that the word schemes there, the devil schemes, is where we get our word method. In other words, that the devil has different methods to trick people and to affect people. And once again, the question is, if you don't know what the truth is, how do you know what a lie is? I don't know if you know this, but when, uh, when uh, people are being trained... Uh, to learn how to recognize what a, what a, what a false uh, bill looks like, before they show the person a false bill, they have this person spend hours and hours and hours learning what a true bill looks like first. Do you know why? Because if you know what truth is, it is so easy to identify what a lie is. Let me tell you what that's so important for you today. And why it's so important for the church today. 
Because there's a whole generation of people that think that when we come to the church, that when we read the Bible, that when we spend time together, and that when we pray together, we're supposed to experience this warm glow all over. It's like, hmm. Listen, and there are times in which we feel things like that. But that is not pri the primary reason why we approach the Bible. We approach the Bible because that's how we get equipped with the truth. Even if you don't feel anything. It is only when the truth of the Word of God is foundational that we can fight against evil and the devil. It is only when we truly believe in the sufficiency of the Word of God and in the power of the Word of God that we can stand against the devil. It is only when we apply the truth of God to the most intimate areas of our lives that we are able to stand against the devil. That's why this is the most foundational truth. Everything else is secondary. So you don't have to listen to me. Listen to Paul. Point one. Point number two. Paul not only give, now he is going to start giving us the weapons and he gives us one practical doctrine. And it's one of the doctrines that flow out of this foundation of truth, which is the doctrine of justification by faith alone. And I'm going to explain what that means in a second. That's exactly what Paul means in the second part of verse 14 when he says, Stand firm then with the breastplate of righteousness in place. Now here, just like the, uh, the belt of truth, there's an objective component and there's a subjective component. The objective component of the righteousness Paul is talking about here is that righteousness that God gives us if we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ. What that means is that if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you are declared righteous before God. You are right with God. That's the objective part. The subjective part is that says that those of us that have been justified before God in Jesus... He turns us into righteous people. Righteousness given, in righteous people we become. I want to give you a few verses because from this one, we, I don't have the whole explanation. But look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, Jesus, so that in him, in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. This is, what he's, this is what he's saying. That positionally, this is a little bit of a class, okay? So bear with me. That positionally and legally, before God, you are forgiven by faith alone. That if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, he declares you righteous before him. Theologians will talk about imputed righteousness or transferred righteousness. Two things happen at the cross when Jesus goes to the cross. Two things happen at the same time. Number one, Jesus takes what we deserve. And at the same time, Jesus gives us who he is. I know a, I know a person that wrote a song called Beautiful Exchange. The Great Exchange. What is it called? Glorious Exchange. If you don't know who that is, that's Jonathan and Sarah. You'll sing it later, right? Not today. Some other time. It's, it's this idea, right? He, he says the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And that is what some of you were, talking about all the crazy stuff we did before Jesus. But you were washed, means declared clean. You were sanctified, meaning you were separated for God. You were justified in the name of Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Look at uh, Romans chapter 3. God is the one that justifies those who have faith in Jesus. This is all theology, people. And this tells you that God gives you something that you didn't work for, that you cannot purchase, that you cannot earn. It's only given to you when you, tr you place your faith in Jesus Christ. This tells you that God declares you righteous because of what Jesus did. 
That tells you that Jesus, when, went, when he went to the cross, he gets treated as the guilty one, and the guilty one, you and me, get treated as the innocent one. This is what tells us that if we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, God sees you in Jesus and through Jesus. Now, people would say, great, Anil, great. How does that change my life? What does that have to do with the devil? Well, number one, I'm going to give you a bunch of reasons here, but number one, one of the tricks of the devil is to make you feel guilty when you don't have to feel guilty or to make you feel guilty and not lead you to repentance. But Romans says, chapter 8, that when you have been justified, there are no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. You know what that means in a very practical way? That it doesn't matter what you have done. Listen up, people. If you are a believer, this is the promise. If you are not a believer, this is what you need. That if you are a person in Jesus, nothing, nothing can take you from God. Nothing can push God away from you. Nothing will bring God closer to you. Nothing, nothing, nothing can separate, separate you from him in Jesus Christ. You know what the word nothing means in the original? Nothing. <laughs> really, nothing. Nor your sin, nor your victories, nor your failures. Nothing. It's all grace. This is all extended to you by God, by grace alone, because you re and you receive it by faith alone. Justification by faith alone is the greatest doctrine in the Bible. And the most practical doctrine in the Bible. That's why Paul says, stand firm. Hold on to it. Believe it with all your heart. Cling to it, cling, cling to it like crazy. Because the devil would always tell you something different. I want to give you two main reasons why this is so important. Number one is because when you truly believe that you have been justified in Jesus Christ, that is the motivation, that is the power, and that is the inspiration for you to want to become a righteous person. For some reason, inside of your heart, once, once you understand and believe this, you will want to become the person that you already are. So look at my definition of a breast, breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness is to be right with God in Jesus, justification, and to live righteously, righteously for God because of Jesus. That's the motivation that's the power. That's the inspiration. Do you know that this is what religious people don't get? Religious people will say, listen, you're struggling. You, you know what you should do? You should try harder. You should try to be a better person. How dare you behave like that? You know what the devil tells me all the time. Are you really going to preach like that? Are you really going to be a pastor after you said that and you thought of that and your motivation was that? You know that the devil never tells me, listen, listen up, people. The devil never tells me you shouldn't be a Christian. I've never heard that from the devil. You know what the devil tells me? He tells me, try harder. Try to be better. Memorize more Bible. Go to church more often. Work hard, serve more, do more. And maybe one day, Hannibal, you will be qualified before God. He never tells me to stop being a Christian. He always tells me to trust what I do more than what Jesus did. That's the lie. And Paul says, stand firm. The second reason... Why the justification by faith is a practical doctrine is because the more you believe this, the more you have this 
the, f- the less you feel the necessity of having to prove yourself. I'm going to ask you 10 questions. And the reason why I'm, I'm going to ask you 10 questions is because I want to make you feel guilty. Because I want that guilt to drive you to Jesus once again. And to trust what he did for you if you are a believer. Question number one. Why do we care so much about titles and positions and accomplishments? What are you trying to prove? Why do you feel so miserable when you are not accepted or appreciated by others the way you think you should? What are you trying to prove? Why do we have the necessity of having to defend ourselves? What are you trying to prove? Why is there, why is there this tendency to, of comparing yourself to others? What are you trying to prove? Why do you pretend to be someone that you're not? What are you trying to prove? Why do you need to be right? What what are you trying to prove? Why can't we be okay with not winning? What are you trying to prove? Why is contentment such a hard thing to practice? What are you trying to prove? Why do you care so much about what people think of your kids? What are you trying to prove? Why are you so afraid of being unnoticed? What are you trying to prove? The answer is this. We do all of that because we forget. We forget that God is big and people are small. We forget that the opinion that matters is what God thinks of us. We forget that because we are in Jesus, God delights in us. We forget that in Jesus we are precious to him. We forget that God loves us just as much as he loves Jesus because we are in him. We forget that even when no one notices, God always does. We forget that even when we are being ignored, he never ignores. We forget that we don't need to justify ourselves because we have been justified in Jesus. We forget that even when we lose, we never lose. We are never losers because we are always in Jesus. We forget that we mean so and so much to him that Jesus came, lived, died, and resurrected. That's how much you are to him. What are you trying to prove? Let me finish with this. A little girl is performing in front of her school. And she's struggling with her her identity a little bit. She finished the performance and everyone loved it. And the mom says, the mom says to her, can you see how much they like you? Can you see how much they appreciate you? Can you see how much they approve of you? But the girl turns around and looks at her mom and says, What do you think of me? You know, we are like that little girl that need to hear from God what we mean to him. And God always says the same thing. I love you as much as I love Jesus because you are in him. See, we need a foundation of truth. The word of God objectively, and the Word of God subjectively. And we learn how to do that when we start with justification by faith alone. Do you believe that? Do you have that? Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you, as always, because your word is truth. We, we thank you, Lord, because in this nation we have the freedom to be exposed to your truth. We thank you, Lord, because we are a nation that have access to the Bible whenever we want to. We thank you, Lord, because we're not being persecuted because of our faith. We get to do life together with other people, so we learn the truth. 
But we thank you, Lord, because the truth is extremely practical. It teaches us, Lord, that there's nothing for us to gain because everything we could possibly want, we already have in Jesus. Because your word teaches, Lord, that there's nothing for us to lose because everything is secure in Jesus. Lord, I pray for WBC, Lord. I pray for Streamwood. I pray for North Avenue. I pray for the Spanish-speaking group. We pray that this church, Lord, may learn and grow in our understanding of who we are to you in Jesus. And we stop trying to prove to anybody anything because we are all to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church says...